Spirit of the living God, um, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your favor, your grace, your mercy, and your holiness. And we thank you, Lord God, that your spirit dwells within us and you'll never leave us nor forsake us. As we get into your word, as always, we do ask for conviction, challenge, and change. We ask to be built up, rattled, shaped, moved, and grown in maturity of the spirit. Lord, give us hearts, not of an outer court believer, but as one who presses into the holy of holies. And we glorify you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I wanted to show you guys something. Um just because for visual, maybe as we say things like <laughs> North and South, Northern tribes, Southern tribes, 10 tribes, two tribes. Okay. So there's 12 tribes of Israel. There's actually 13, but one of them doesn't have land. So it's not listed, but the 12 tribes are all given a portion of land, right? Judah was the largest tribe, which is Jesus tribe, which is David's tribe. And Within the center of Judah's tribe was the tribe of Simeon. So the northern tribes were the, the other 12 tribes. Okay, all of these tribes are here. Benjamin was the tribe of Saul, where the very first king of Israel was from. Benjamin and Judah border each other, and Jerusalem is, is cut in half. Half Benjamin, half uh, Judah. And that's where David chose to make the capital of Israel, actually God. Okay, so right now where we are, we're looking at when it says Israel, we're looking at all of these tribes and Judah being Simeon and Judah. Are you guys understanding that? Okay, when we get into the book of Kings, it's actually going to switch and the southern tribes are going to be Judah and Benjamin because everybody in Simeon is going to run up north. But we'll get there when we get there. So you guys got that right now? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to turn this off because we don't need it anymore. Okay, so we are in chapter 20. 2 Samuel chapter 20. This is entitled, Ignore Sheba's Trumpet. Now, you guys remember last week, uh, David was returning to Jerusalem. And um, the people, David had won the civil war against Absalom. And the, the nation was like, Oh, man, what do we do now? We chose Absalom because he looked good. He had long hair. He told us David was bad. And he got his butt whooped in the war. And really, David all along has been the one that's blessed our nation. He's, he's made us prosper. He shut down all of our enemies. And we turned our backs on him. So, so what do we do now? And David... The word of this dispute going on through the nation reached his ears. And so what David did is he reached out to his own tribe of Judah and said, how come you haven't brought me back to the throne, brought me back to the capital, back to the palace? And so what he did, he made some political moves um, in seeking to reunify the nation and one of his nephews was the commanding general. His name was Amasa, Amasa, and he lost to David's army. But David said, you can be the general of the army. Even though you were a traitor, I forgive you. And he fired his other nephew, Joab, because Joab had killed his son, Absalom. So now Amasa, the trade, the, the 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 general that was trying to kill David is now the commander of David's army. And as he was on his way, uh, he ran into Shimei. Or Shimei ran out to meet David. Shimei, you remember Shimei was cussing David out and throwing rocks and kicking up dust. But when David won the war, he was like, hey, you know what, bro? Forget all that stuff that happened because you know I, I was just joking. I didn't mean it, <laughs> right? So David says, you're not going to die, at least not while I'm alive. 
And then Mishibosheth came. And you can remember Mishibosheth's servant ditched him and left him and lied to David and told him that he turned his back on him. Mishibosheth was like, listen, I couldn't do anything about it because I'm paralyzed or, or, or I'm disabled. And he ran off, left me. Everything that I prepared for you as a gift, he gave it to you and said it was on him. And David was like, I don't want to hear anything else about it. You guys just divide the land. And Meshubosheth said, I don't care about the land. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just care that you, my king, are safe and back at home ruling as you should be. And then there was Barzarelli, the rich old man who provided for David, his family, and his army while they were getting prepared to go to battle with Absalom. And David wanted to bless him and bring him back to the palace and give him a good life in the palace. And the Burrs or Rally was like, dude, I'm 80 years old. I can't go to the club. All my food tastes the same. What am I going to do in the palace? Like, just let me die at home. But take my son and bless him the way you want to bless me. And so David did. Which brings us to where we're about to start. So I'm just going to read uh, chapter uh, 1940 and we'll jump into 20. So it says, now the king went on to Gilgal and Chimeon went with him. And all the people of Judah escorted the king, also the half, half of the people of Israel. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said, why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household and David's men with him across the Jordan? So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, saying, because the king is a close relative of, of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten anything at the king's expense or did he give us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, we have 10 shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Okay, so like we pointed out, David actually sowed the seeds of this division by only reaching out to his own tribe. He should have reached out to the entire nation. As a result, Israel, the northern tribes that we were just looking at, got into an argument, into a beef with Judah. Now, this was right on the heels of a civil war. And so everything is fragile. And now Israel, the northern tribes, feel disrespected and despised. And they're like, you guys have dogged us out. You're the ones who turned on them first, and we're the ones who said, let's bring them back first. But it ended saying that the men of Judah had words that were fiercer than the uh, men of Israel. I don't know what that means, but basically, Judah won the argument. All right, so you guys got all that? Now, all of this is happening on the day David is on his way back to the palace. So you got the, the Crips being Israel, the Bloods being Judah, arguing over the king. Is, is that making sense? Okay. When did the lightning's turn, baby? Chapter 20. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bickery, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, we have no share in David, nor have we an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. Okay, so the Holy Spirit calls Sheba a rebel or a son of Belial, which means a wicked, worthless, good for nothing, unprofitable base fellow who causes ruin and destruction. In other words, the scripture sees Sheba as a child of the devil. 
Now, his name, Sheba, it means seven. And you know, in, in scripture, seven is a number of completion. His father's name is Bickery, which means youthful. So in essence, what it's saying is the complete son of youthfulness never matured and is a worthless child of the devil out to cause destruction and ruin. So being a man of Belial, Sheba, he took this opportune time to gain advantage of the, over the northern tribe's feelings of being despised, rejected, and alienated by David's favoritism. Mm. You know, the devil always takes an opportune time to take an opportune time. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Now, as a result, for the most part, the ten tribes north of Judah turned from following their God-given king in order to follow a man of Benjamin named Sheba, who was rebelling against God's chosen leader. Now, like we looked at at the at the at the map, um, the tribe of Simeon, Simeon was actually in the center of Judah's territory, so it was basically considered. To be with Judah. And then like I said later. Uh, we'll see that Benjamin actually stays with Judah. When every other tribe. Um, including Simeon. Goes north with Israel. And that's after Solomon's death. Okay. So we got the 12 tribes. But then there's this 13th tribe. The tribe of Levi. The, tree be the tribe of Levi. Wasn't counted among the other tribes. Because they weren't given any land. It was a tribe of priests. So the priests had cities scattered throughout all of Israel, and they were loyal to the king because they were loyal to God. But they weren't counted as one of the tribes because they had no property. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> now, in the church, there are many Absalons and many Shebas. And many of them are saved. But their heart's desire is not about building people up. Mm. It's not about teaching people to follow God according to the word. Mm. In 2 Timothy 3, it tells us, In the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, mm. lovers of money, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, traitors, mm. despisers of good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, all having a form of godliness, but denying his power. See, the desire in the hearts of the Absalons and the Shebas that are in the church is to have people follow them rather than God. And so they cleverly build people up to depend upon them in order to grow their ministry rather than God's ministry. So there's two ways to approach this. Either this is my ministry or this is the Lord's ministry. And if it's my ministry, I want you to have to need me so that I stay on top and grow. But if it's God's ministry, you're equipped to grow in God wherever that may take you. The Absalons and the Shebas appeal to the weak. They search out the dissatisfied and emotionally driven self-seeking Christians who are not truly grounded in the word. Mm. See, the Shebas and the Absalons, in their own way, blow the trumpet saying, we have no share in the true teaching of the word of God. Because the true teaching of the word of God makes disciples of Christ. That's good. But I will program you to be a faithful follower of me. Mm. There are some churches people are in and the church is really bad for them. But they have been conditioned and programmed to believe that if they leave the church... If they separate from this pastor, they're no longer saved. So they have to stay there and they're faithful to the pastor. 
are faithful to the church and not to God. In Acts 20, verse 29, Paul wrote, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in from among you, not sparing a flock. Men from among yourselves will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That's the Shebas and the Absalons. Not to unity in Christ, but follow me. Verse 3. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Okay, so this goes back to the women that David had left to take care of the house when Absalom came into Jerusalem. Leviticus 18.8 says, The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. And Leviticus 20.11 says, The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Absalom had came into the palace and violated his father's wives on the roof. But he was still David's son. So on top of forcing these women, he committed an act of incest in the eyes of the Lord and made his name an abomination. When God was judging Israel, this was one of the issues that he had with them. In, Acts, in Amos 2.7, he says, they trample the helpless people in the dust and shove the oppressed out of the way to pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. This was one of the most disrespectful things that Absalom could do to both God and the king. Now, in David's case, in this case, David's wives were innocent. I mean, they really didn't have a choice. So divorcing them or punishing them wouldn't be a correct response. See, because they were royal concubines, they couldn't be allowed to remarry because that would be usurping the throne. He couldn't punish them because it really wasn't their fault. But he couldn't violate the law of God and go back to them after his son had violated them. So the most and the best thing David could do is never be with them again, but also provide for them. Even though they had to live the rest of their lives as widows. Now, I'm thinking that these 10 concubines probably had never had kids by David because he took all his kids with him and their mothers. And I'm hoping that they were already old because that'd be kind of jacked up if they were really young <laughs> and then they had to be widows for the rest of their life. I mean, the scripture don't tell us, but anyway, Verse four, and the king said to Amasa, assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. Now, remember, Amasa is the new general of Israel's army. But he was also the general that fought against David. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah but he delayed longer than the time set which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. 
So Joab's men with the Cherites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of the Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichari. Okay, so Amasa, Amasa is the commander of the army. David gave him orders to gather Judah's military, Judah's army, and report back to him for inspection and deployment for this mission to crush Sheba in three days. And it needed to be done immediately. See, David was a wise leader. And he knew the longer you let a seed sit and grow, the greater the destruction would be later. So what he said is we have to nip this in the bud immediately before it blooms. Because Sheba has the potential to do more than Absalom because he will divide the nation on a tribal level. Absalom's attack was against David. But under Absalom, the nation was still united. But this rebellion would split the nation at a core, at its core. Now, the problem with Amasa was this. He wasn't a seasoned general or respected like Absalom. On top of that, he had just lost the war against David. But being the leader of Absalom's rebel army, David made this political move <coughs> for the people and out of spite against Joab for killing Absalom. And he placed the unqualified, wishy-washy person into office. <laughs> but Amasa, being not qualified for this position, was late in fulfilling his king's command. So David had to turn to his other nephew, Abishai, his second in command, and gives him orders to take Israel's army. But this time it's Israel's A-team. It's David's mighty men, his personal guard, his, all the, the strongest troops his Philistine mercenaries that stood by his side through everything and sent them to go track down Sheba to snuff his light, to snuff his lights out. Now, in verse seven, it says, so Joab's men with the Cherotites, the Pelites, and all the mighty men went out after him. So even though David had demoted Joab for killing Absalom, all of Israel's true warriors still regarded Joab as the leader. And they knew that they could trust him and follow him in the battle. <coughs> Verse 8. When they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor, and on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa didn't notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike again. Thus, he died. All right. I'm going to try to paint this picture to you guys what's going on. As Joab, Abishai, all the mighty men, Davis A-team are on their way out of Jerusalem to battle. Here comes Amasa, late, with the rest of the army. Now, at first, you got to think about it. They didn't have telephones, right? <laughs> so it wasn't clear if Amasa was late, maybe because he joined Sheba. Because remember, he was the leader of the rebellion army. Nobody knew if he took his time on purpose so that he could give Sheba time to build his forces. Or if he was late simply because he was 
unqualified and incompetent to do the job. Whatever the case was, as the general of the army, he was late. And he couldn't do a good as job as Joab could in this position. Now, Joab felt Amasa was a traitor. And he definitely was not more qualified than me to be in my position. But on top of that, Joab's saying, he had the, the nerve to be late for his duties. While wearing my uniform. <laughs> and he's still not ready for battle. See, Joab was dressed in battle armor. But Amasa was wearing Joab's dress uniform with his stripes on it. Anyway, it says Joab's sword fell out as they were approaching each other. And when Joab picked it up, Amasa didn't think anything of it. Now, check this out. Joab was skilled, battle-hardened, always on his P's and Q's. He knew how to keep his sword secure. I think he dropped it on purpose. Right? He dropped it on purpose so he can shank this dude. <laughs> Right? He drops his sword. We need a dictionary for the back. He picks it up with his left hand because the right hand was always the hand, the hand of war and battle. And he says to his cousin, Amasa, little cousin, are you in good health? Right? Grabs him by the beard because that's customary. That was like the bro, bro hug, right? And Amasa wasn't paying attention. He was slipping. And Joab didn't play when it came to somebody taking his job. No, it's like the third time. <laughs> That's the I mean, can you can, check this out? Can you imagine on the on on the palace career board the reactions? Of wanted new general of the army in place of Joab. Please apply his side. That's not a job I want. So it says, after Joab stabs Ab uh, Amasa, then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him. When he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. When he was removed from the highway, the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bickery. Okay. So. When a master showed up late. He had the army with him like he was supposed to, but he was late. And Joab shanked him and then took off on his mission like David ordered. Joab just reinstated himself as the general of the army. And so one of Joab's lieutenants shouted to the troops that were following Amasa, look, if you're with Joab and David, follow Joab. But the soldiers had got rounded up by Amasa and they're like kind of in shock. Like, well, what do we do now? Because David made him the general and he just got killed. I mean, if we follow Joab, are we in, disobe in disobedience? Like, you know. So 
So they're sitting there looking at this dude with his guts hanging out, laying in his blood. Like, I mean, what do we do now? So Joab's lieutenant tossed him out of the way, covered him up, and they're like, I guess it's good to go. <laughs> A master's dead body was an obstacle to moving forward. Yeah. Come on. That's good. And sometimes the things that we thought were right mm. become dead bodies and obstacles to our moving forward. Mm. And so they have to be thrown out of the way and covered up. And verse 14 says, so he, being a, a Sheba, went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth and Makkah and all the Barites. So they were gathered together and went after Sheba. Then they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah and cast up a siege mount against the city. And it stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Okay, so back on the day when when David David was returning, um, Sheba had pumped everybody up to forsake David and to follow him, right? They were like, yeah, we're out of here. You know, we're through with David, blah, 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 blah. But then after everybody cooled down, they realized, like, you know, that was stupid. Like, Sheba is, like, Al Sharpton. Why are we following this dude? And so they dropped the idea and didn't want to follow Sheba. So Sheba went all through the country trying to emotionally hype people up to follow him. It was like David's police are running around the country, gunning down innocent black doctors and lawyers and preschool children. So we must go burn down the cities. But in the end, the only people Sheba could get to support him were the non-rational thinking people of his own family's clan. So realizing he was outnumbered and Joab was on his trail, Sheba and the men that followed him uh, hold themselves up in a city that they imposed themselves upon. And then Joab, with the entire army, came to the city in order to tear this city down just to get this one dude. You guys get the picture? Yeah. Now, you guys seen the old movies with the battle sieges where... The army has the, the, the city surrounded and, you know, they're like trying to attack the wall and all this stuff. Okay. Well, sometimes that would take like two, three, four years. When the Romans went to siege a city, they prepared for a 20 year stay. Now, what they did in the siege is they completely surrounded the city and cut off everything. All the water supply, any trade going in and out, it was shut down. Eventually, the people ran out of water, ran out of food, and starved themselves so bad that they would just surrender or just get ran over. Right? But Joab wasn't planning on doing that kind of siege. They immediately were going to just tear down the city and destroy it. And verse 16 says, Then a wise woman cried out from the city, Hear, hear! Please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near, the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. She said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. He said, I'm listening. So she spoke saying, They used to talk in former times saying, They shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. 
I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? So this woman, she had more courage and more wisdom and more common sense than everybody in the city. And she cried out so that she could speak a word to Joab. And so Joab came near to hear what she had to say. Now, you got to think back. We're talking about God's people, Israel, who all knew the word of God. This was a command from David to get Sheba. And hopefully before he got to a city where he could close himself in. But he made it to one to close himself in. Joab is there ready to tear down the city to get him. But in Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, God said, When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim and offer a peace to it. And it shall be if they accept your offer of peace, and open up to you, then all the people who are found in shall be placed under tribute and serve you. But if the city will not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. So at this point, by the command of God, there had to be a negotiation. Are you guys willing to meet our terms of surrender or not? And so this woman came and was like, hey, check this out. Abel is the city known for its wisdom. When there was disputes, people came here. I have something I want to say to you. I have a proposal. And so Joab is like, what's up? And she's like, you know our city's reputation. Everybody came here to seek the wisdom of the men and women in the city to settle disputes. So why are you out there trying to destroy a mother city in Israel and all of its people? And verse 20, it says, And Joab answered and said to her, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That's not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichari by name, has raised up his hand against the king against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, watch, his head will be thrown over the wall to you. Okay, now, in my mind, this is just Daryl's brain. He's standing there with Abishai, his little brother, like, man, you hear that? That's the kind of woman I'm talking about. Joab was like, hey, 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 yo, 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 check it out, check it out. Can I get the cage number to your carrier pigeon? <laughs> she's about the business, right? Yeah. Oh so she's like, hold that thought. Then the woman, in her wisdom, went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bickery, and threw it out to Joab. And he blew the trumpet and withdrew from the city. Every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. So she went back and was like, listen. Y'all know that's Joab out there. Joab, the Joab. It's either this dude and all of us or this dude. So they chopped off his head, slung it over the wall. <laughs> Sheba thought that he could openly oppose the will of God and divide the nation of Israel and then hide. But in Jeremiah 23, 23, it says, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord? And not a God far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? In other words, you don't have to worry 
Don't you know that your arms are too short to fight me? Your legs ain't fast enough to outrun me. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you. Now, okay, you know how you're like, maybe you're at a park or somewhere and people are hitting softballs and soccer balls or whatever, and you're not paying attention, and then the ball is on its way, what does everybody yell? Ball. No, heads up. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They slung his head over the wall. Yeah. Oh, or... <laughs> Verse 23. And so now we're looking at David's government. Now, you got to remember... At this time, David is about 65. He's going to be dead in about five years. Wow. Really? And Joab was over all the army of Israel. He got his job back. Benaiah, the son of Jedodiah, was over the Cheritites and the Pelethites. Remember, that's David's mighty man, his, his personal guard. Oh, yeah. We're going to meet Benaiah again. David did some adjusting to his administration. Adoram was in charge of the revenue. He was the tax collector. We're going to meet him again, too. Jehoshaphat, the son of Eliud, was the recorder. Now, I was like, what the heck is a recorder? Kind of, sort of. The, the, the recorder was like a chancellor. Um, he brought all the weighty matters to the king. He brought all the disputes. He, he told him what was happening with the citizens and um, non-citizens. Uh, he drew up papers for the king's guidance. And he prepared drafts for the king's command to the scribes. All the treaties had to pass by his oversight. Um, he took care of the National Archives, the, the, the library, with all the scrolls in it. And he added new volumes and additions to that library, right? So he was like really important. Shiva was the scribe. The scribe took down everything. You know, you know, we, uh, they call them trans, transcribers, I think, in court now. What do they call them? You know, like if you, if you ever been to court, some of you innocent people don't know. Stenographer, right. Those are the scribes. They wrote down everything on the scroll, everything that was said. And they wrote down the scriptures. Scribes are very important. Um, the Hebrew scribes, when they were writing the scriptures, they counted every letter, every space. And if they were off, they would burn the whole scroll and start back over. Zadok and Abathar were the priests. And Ira, the Cherite, was a chief minister under David. He was kind of like David's... Um, he wasn't a priest, so he would be like the chaplain or his his spiritual go-between. Now, in closing, in our lives, there are Shebas. 
Being an in, uh, agent of the enemy, Sheba comes in many forms. But he never misses an appointment to show up at an opportune time when things are fragile. When things are fragile, yet in the beginning process of moving towards healing, towards growth, towards reconciliation and forgiveness, this is when Sheba shows up. He stirs up to cause pride and rebellion. Now, the thing about the Shebas are they are good in unifying opposing parties to walk in agreement with the devil. While at the same time, making them both feel like they're in the right and on God's side. Like, say you're beginning to come to church. And you're beginning to make changes in your life. And those changes are going to grow you in stability and in the wisdom and knowledge of God. Sheba will show up in the form of somebody saying something that you don't like. But instead of moving past it, the Sheba in you takes offense and you don't come back. See, the devil comes to steal, to kill and destroy. He comes to divide and separate you from the will of God. But he gets you to do it to yourself all while making you feel like you're in the right. Rather than giving up your right to be right. So you can have two people who are in disagreement with each other. But if they would humble themselves, they would be in agreement with God and go forward. But when Sheba enters, everybody takes their position and nobody moves forward in God. So instead of being where God wants you to be so that you can get what you need, the Sheba in another person stores, stirs them up and runs you off. And the Sheba in you allows it to happen. And you both walk away patting your back feeling like you're in the right. Proverbs 14.1 says, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. We destroy our own house, taking a position, planting a flag, thinking that we're right. Sheba is our strongholds. You know what strongholds are? They're where people retreat to for safety. Strongholds are our fortresses. My thoughts, emotions, my reasons, my arguments, and everything that I rely upon to fortify my opinion and position against the Lord who I have made my opponent. When ancient battles took place and an army wanted to penetrate the city's wall or the city's stronghold, the people on the other side of the wall would plug it up with garbage, trash, dead bodies, debris, anything that they could to keep the enemy out. When we raise up our strongholds, when God is penetrating my defense. I'll try to keep them out and justify my position, justify my attitude, my behaviors with any kind of garbage excuse that I can think of to justify standing my ground against the righteous way of God that causes, that calls for me to humble myself. And if I humble myself before the mighty hand of God, I have to look at myself and change. And since I don't want to do that, I need to raise my stronghold. I had an incident happen the other day and it really upset me because I watched it transpire. It played out right in front of me. And Sheba got the best of both people. 
and nobody move forward in God. Proverbs 11, 2 states, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble, there is wisdom. And Proverbs 13, 10 says, by pride comes nothing but strife. But with the well advised is wisdom. And Proverbs 21 30 declares, There's no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. In other words, if God says, This is the way you should go, walk in it, humble yourself before me, and I say, No, that's pride. That's the Sheba in me, blowing the trumpet. Saying, I have no part in the way of God in the name of Jesus. Because you know how you do things wrong and you say it's the Lord? That's the Sheba. It's only when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of the Lord that we can tear down the strongholds and cut off the ways of the head of the ways of our deceitful hearts. Then we can see the plan of the enemy. And resist the devil. And it's only then that we can ignore Sheba's trumpet. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, that you always call us to a greater level, a greater humility, a greater surrender. That we can do your will and be pleasing in your sight. Help us, Father, to recognize when we are lying to ourselves, when we are standing in pride, when we would rather have my way than your way. We praise you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That was good.